back here. We got a couple announcements. I should have drill next Sunday, so that's what's happening next Sunday. Douglas will be back to speak. Uh, we also have communion Sunday today, so if you're watching online, get those elements ready because we will be uh, doing communion here shortly. First Sunday of the month, communion Sunday, and then Sunday school kicks off real soon, a couple weeks, a few more Sundays from now, and we will be starting our adult and children's Sunday school, so that will be happening again soon. If you would now, just let's take a moment. Let's, oh, oh, we got we got another announcement. Now, no announcement, no other announcement. Okay, all right. So, it, without any other announcements, let's just go into a time of prayer together. Would you bow your heads? Let's pray. God, we are looking to direct our attention to you. God, we're thankful for this church and, and for what you are doing in this place, what you have been doing in this place for well over 100 years. Not necessarily in this same location, but God, you have been working through this church and its history for over 100 years. And God, the faithful people who have gone before us, who have been in many people's lives examples and models to to how to follow Jesus and God we just pray that we would be the same for that next generation all the way down to the little ones that are crying right now God that will grow up and we pray that we will be a real example of what it looks like to follow Jesus to the next generations and so God we pray for that we pray that you just continue to be just in our midst this morning, God, we welcome you into this time. We pray that you would just be blessed by this service. And we love you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, if you would now, uh, as Janet makes her way up here, if you'd stand with me. Let's go ahead and let's, uh, let's say the Lord's Prayer together, if we, if we would. So if, you, if you'd stand and let's say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. As we are continuing our time of prayer, I'd love to hear some prayer requests, maybe some uh, praise reports. I do have one to share from Connie, Connie Wedge. Just going to share that with you guys here in a moment. But uh, we got any other prayer requests or praise reports? Yeah, Rob. Yeah. Feeling good? Good. Yeah. yeah, Rob, you're welcome. Glad you're glad you're doing well. Others? Randy. Welcome. Go ahead. Wallace. 
Wallace, the Wallace man. Yeah. Okay. And Randy, your brother's name again? Dean. Dean. All right. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, Les. Okay, so after the convention that we got this talk to last week, uh, everything went well. It was a great blessing. Uh, we have a special request for one of the great Southern gospel music pianists. Same. Okay. Yep. It's like your brothers or something. Thinking along the same line. All right. Anything else? Okay. Why don't we take these things to the Lord together? Then, if you'd bow your heads, let's pray on these things. Lord. Just so thankful, so thankful, God, for what you're doing in Connie's life. God, she said that uh, she's made some progress and she'll be starting some outpatient therapy, God, in a week or so. And we just pray, Lord, that you would just help her. She's got a lot of nerve pain. And God, I just pray that the therapy would go well, that you would bring healing to her body. And we're thankful for Connie and what you're doing in her life. And God, we pray for just Rob's healing and the fact that he's kind of looking uh, forward now. He's behind those procedures, feeling good, and we just praise you for Rob, God, and we're thankful for him and that we could just be a blessing, Lord. We just want to be a church that blesses each other, so we're thankful for Rob. God, we're thankful for Randy's brother Dean being here. We're thankful, God, just for family. Uh, It's so good to have um, church family, and it's also good to have your family be a part of your church family, even if it's just a visit from time to time. God, we're just thankful for him, just pray blessings on him and his time with his family here, God. And we pray for for both Les and Arthur's concerns around Jeff Stice and the COVID and what's going on in his life. God, we pray for healing. Lord, today I know um, we're going to be talking about Psalm 40 and just, God, how you are our help and our deliverer. And Lord, there's so much that's just been shared by uh, this group of people this morning where we need your help. God, Mike and his brother need your help with the cancer. God, we're praying for deliverance. We're praying for mercy and grace in their lives. The Wallace family need your help. So much going on there. God, they need to experience you as their helper, as their deliverer. And Lord, we're asking for that, that you would move mightily in each of these people's lives praying for that Jesus. We love you, God. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So at this time, if you would uh, stand, we're going to worship together.
Janet. So before we dive into our message this morning, we have communion, as I mentioned earlier. So what I'm going to do first off, let's get this kind of cleared off. Make sure my phone's on silent. And going to get to the place for our text this morning, which comes from Corinthians chapter 11. And one of the things that you've probably heard before uh, is that communion is, is a time of, to be quiet and reflect. Um, it's fun, isn't it? Uh, so as, uh, as we go into this time together, I encourage all of us to just take a moment and say, God, what's going on in in my life because we can get busy and we can get just going especially I mentioned a little bit ago about summer and just all that you know goes along with that and the activities and just this is a time to reflect on God what's going on in in my life and what do you want to reveal to me and also it's a time to remember what God has done It's not just about, you know, okay, God, where am I at in my journey? We can get caught up in the my and the me, and it's like, no, but God, thank you for what you've done in my life, but also in humanity's sake, right? For the sake of humanity, what you have done most notably through Jesus, his coming, his dying, his raising from the dead thankful for what God has done. So it's, it's that time to reflect on those things. So at this point, uh, Les, Kay, would you come forward? I'm going to get you to help me out this morning. Why don't we begin just by praying together? Would would you pray with me, God? We just invite you into our our time together here in regards to reflecting on maybe what you want to speak to us. God, we do want to respond accordingly to what it is you're wanting to do in our lives, how you're wanting to work. God, open our eyes and our ears to what you're wanting to teach us and say to us. And then, of course, God, this is a time to be grateful, grateful for what you've done grateful for your son and for reconnecting us to you and making it possible for us to have a relationship with you that's forever. And so, God, we're thankful for that. We just pray that you would just bless this communion time. In Jesus' name, amen. As they pass out the elements, I would invite you just to hold on to them. And then once all of them have been passed out, we'll take them together.
it, for I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's break the bread and receive. And we know in the same way, Paul said, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant, this new agreement between God and humanity. And Paul says, Jesus said, this is a covenant or an agreement made in my blood, Jesus' blood. Do this, he says, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's receive Paul ends by saying, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, you proclaim God's grace on the world, his act of redemption to humanity, and we proclaim that, God, you will, of course, come again for your people. As the uh, element wrappers get picked up, I'm going to... Move us into our study time. I got it again. Thank you. The Psalms. Now, I've been here for exactly a year this month. I didn't start preaching until October, but I came on in September of 2020. And most of you know by now that I like to do a series. So if you're getting nervous thinking this guy's going to be in the Psalms forever, that's not where we're going, okay? I'm not going to be going through every single Psalm. We're going to be looking at your Psalm. What do you mean your Psalm? Well, let me tell you, I turned, as many of you know, you were at the party you threw for me here, I turned 40 a few months back. In fact, I still have this saved. I just can't get myself to use it yet. This is my happy, the big 40th birthday toilet paper. So I'm just keeping that in the reserves. Turned 40 back in June, and you guys threw me a great party. So what I mean by your psalm, here's what I mean by your psalm. I'm talking about making the psalm that corresponds with your age, your psalm for the year. Or for at least as long until you have your next birthday, right? And so the idea here is that we do this. Your psalm, so whatever your psalm is, is it? Is it Psalm 80? Is it Psalm, where's Charlotte? Charlotte, is it Psalm 10? What is your psalm? And you read that. The idea is out of your psalm. Notice how each of these correspond with the one, two, three. So you choose at least one verse out of your psalm that you are going to memorize. Number two, you're going to read it often. At least twice a week, you're going to read your psalm. And three, you're going to encourage three other people that don't attend Shabona to do this. Say, hey, I'm doing this at my church. It's a cool idea to read your psalm, to choose one of the verses out of it, to memorize, to read it at least twice a week, and maybe share this with three others. Now, ultimately, the point of this exercise is to spur all of us on and others to read the Bible more consistently and also to memorize Scripture. For these two activities, reading Scripture and memorizing Scripture, are important to help us grow in our faith as well as resist temptation in our lives, right? In fact, I think the Bible might have something to say about this. Ah, Psalm 119. 
10 and 11, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So as we think about the Psalms, no one's 119 here, right? So I, I didn't steal anyone's Psalm. So 119, 10 and 11 says that you need to seek God with all your heart and you're not going to seek God if you don't read his love letter to you. You are not going to know the God of the Bible if you don't read the Bible. And you certainly aren't going to have his word hidden in your heart if you don't memorize it. If you don't really internalize it, right? So that's the idea. Because the goal isn't just for information. It's for transformation. I didn't make that up. Look at old D.L. Moody here. Look at that nice beard right there. D.L. Moody said, the Bible was not given for our information alone, right? It's not just for our information, but for our transformation. So it's not just to eternalize it. It's not just to memorize it. That's the idea of like, hey, tell some people, hey, I'm doing this. I'm reading this. You want to do this with me? Because, you know, ultimately, as we're going to look in Psalm 40, it is about how God has changed the world through his involvement, his regular, ongoing, sometimes very much behind the scenes, but all the more, I think, powerful at times, even though we don't see it, his involvement in our world. And that we need God. We need him. We're going to look at this. We're going to be reminded of this in Psalm 40. In fact, Psalm 40 is really about how God is our help and our deliverer. Our help and our deliverer. So this morning, so there's 17 verses in Psalm 40. We're going to walk through them together. But sometimes I think, at least for my brain, it's easier to kind of compartmentalize things, like put them in sections. But it's all about how God is our help and our deliverer. That's why I underlined, underlined point three. It's all about how God is our help and our deliverer. That's what Psalm 40 is about. But within that, we see here in verses 1 through 3, God hears our cries. In the next section, verses 4 through 10, God is faithful. And in the final section, 11 through 17, again, it emphasizes this overall point in Psalm 40, which is God is our help and our deliverer. So let's look at it. God hears our cries. Let's look at the first section, verses 1 through 3. Part 1, God hears our cries. He's our help. He's our deliverer. Is someone helpful to you if they don't hear you when you're in trouble? No. Or if they ignore you when you're crying out. So yes, God is our help. And our deliverer, he hears our cries. Notice verse 1 says, in the beginning it says, For the director of music of David, a psalm. So it reminds us that the psalms were originally written to be sung to God. While musicians were playing like stringed instruments. In fact, the NIV study Bible notes that the Hebrew title traditionally for the psalms is speaker, or really just speaks of praise, rather. So that Hebrew traditional title for the Psalms is praise or praises. It's about this worship, this singing to God. He says here, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. I want to point something out right away, something that I struggle with. Waited patiently. Anybody struggle with that just a little bit? Anybody seen this on their computer? <laughs> is that just a little? Depending on what you're doing or what's going on, how irritating is that? Like, come on. I just got to go. Please wait. Please wait. So I read uh, this article from Forbes. 
And here is a quote from the article, or an excerpt from the article. Forbes, this is written this year, so this is very current. February 22nd, 2021. Here's an excerpt from the article. Impatience, especially when it becomes a character trait, is not a virtue. It is a flaw that causes chronic stress, ongoing disappointment, and forces people to overwork or cut corners in an attempt to beat the clock. And then it asks the question, the result of this? Incomplete tasks, half-achieved goals, strained relationships, and never-ending rational rationalizations as to why the costs incurred are really not so bad. We justify it. This is certainly not a Christian site. Forbes is just telling it like it is, though. We are impatient, and our impatience causes these things. It goes on to say in the article, many people mistake patience for sitting around and doing nothing. Especially those who think they can make the world spin faster. So for those people who are just constantly on the move, they think, oh, patience is just sitting around and not doing anything. It goes on to say we must understand that true patience is the result of determination. It goes on to say some more in that article. But it's enough for the point that I want to make. So when we patiently wait on the Lord, this does not mean that we're sitting around not doing anything. Rather, we pursue God in prayer, in his word, with great determination and expectancy that he will guide our lives. That he's going to provide in the help that we need in times of real difficulty in just the times of questioning about, God, what should I do next? Or where should I go? And even if that help in the, in the long run looks totally different than what we are hoping for or expecting, God is going to move. I think the key that I want to focus in on, though, in light of our point in our study, is, let me get us back to that is this, I waited pa patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. Remember, everything about what we're focusing on in Psalm 40 is that God is our help and our deliverer. And note here, it says, He turned to me and He heard my cry. I like the way the New English translation put it. I relied completely on the Lord and He turned toward me and heard my cry for help. I mean, think about that, you guys. It's the God of the universe, your creator, my creator, stoops down and hears our cries. Now, I want to make something clear. David is not saying here, he's not making the claim that God rescues everybody out of every situation that they're in. We know that's not true. But David is definitely saying that my God, my creator, is totally capable of rescuing me. And he has before, and I hope he will again as we continue to read in this psalm. We know that many brothers and sisters in Christ have lost their lives in recent events in our world. We don't have to go into details. It's been hard. It's been hard watching hard wondering what's going on in other parts of the world. And those who, who love God and who have been faithful to our country, and we are wondering what's going to happen, what has happened. And of course, God has not always intervened throughout history for his people. John the Baptist, right? is a good example. I mean, Jesus was literally on the scene with John the Baptist, and yet John the Baptist was martyred. God doesn't always intervene. David is not making a claim here that God will always rescue, will always turn the events out the way that we are hoping. Nevertheless, David is saying he is able. 
and he has done it before, and he will do it again, whether it's in my own life or in the lives of other people. Check it out. There's a psalm that you probably know very well where David says this, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are what? With me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. David didn't say, oh, you will pull me out of that dark valley every time. And David know, knew that, and we know that. And so we want to make sure that as we articulate our faith to other people and we get into conversations with people, we are not walking around saying that God's always going to take care of the problem. But no, he's going to walk through the problem with us, won't he? And according to God's purposes, his providence, he may choose to pull us out of the trouble or he's going to call us to go to be with him. Right? Or something else is going to happen. Either way, God is totally aware of our situation and he is with us. This leads us nicely to Psalm uh, 40, verse 2. So verse 2, it says, He lifted me out of the slimy pit. Who's been in a slimy pit lately? Out of the mud and the mire, he set my feet on a rock and he gave me a firm place to stand. The ESV Puts it like this, he drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog. So we got slimy pit, miry bog. Any places you guys want to sign up to go to? Yeah, send me to the pit of destruction, please. The slimy bog, the miry bog, whatever. I don't want to go there. Let me ask you a question. When is the last time you reflected on how much God has done in your life? how much he has changed you over the years. I encourage all of us this week to spend a little time alone thinking about our past and how God has taken us out of those pits, those bogs, the mud and the mire in our lives. Here's another question. Believer, non-believer, we all need to go to God and ask him to help us see the things in our life presently that need to change. Because we're pretty good at cleaning ourselves up on the outside. I'm all, I'm all good. Got everything together. But on the inside, we're all, we're all pretty messy, right? You see, a big part of what this sermon is is about is that we need God not just for guidance to make us happy or for that invisible friend to talk to. No, we need a God who is all-powerful, who is tremendously loving and gracious and changes sinful people and helps them thrive in a broken world, right? We need a God like that, not just a God that makes me happy or just helps me to understand what's going on and, and maybe just my own little present situation. We need a God that changes me from the inside out, takes care of this mess in my heart. Isn't that encouraging? That God is our help and our deliverer and that he desires to change our circumstances? You see, we need a God that cleans us up. Does, I don't know, maybe, maybe, you, maybe you've experienced that. And that's why I'm, I'm, that's why I'm encouraging you to, to reflect on, God, I remember that season where I was just a mess. Thank you, God, for taking me out of that miry pit and cleaning me up. Thank you, God. You set my feet on a rock, a solid foundation. The NIV says, you, get, you gave me a firm place to stand. The ESV says, you make my steps secure. Talk about just kind of a hard couple of weeks in the news. This was a hard week for many in the United States, wasn't it? Hurricane Ida and the storms that spun off from it were devastating. You know, many of you realize that Jesus called himself the rock. He taught about his words were like a rock. They served as a solid and continue to serve as a solid foundation for life's difficulties. And this is especially true when it comes to working through life in a messed up world. 
as well as working through the sin and selfishness in my own heart. Look at that picture. Photos from CNN.com. Hurricane Ida. What did David say? You put my feet on a rock. You gave me the ability to have solid ground to walk on. Secure steps. No one wants to be caught in a flash flood. No one wants the ground that they're standing on, or the, at least their legs be swept out from underneath them as water rushes by. Matthew 7, Jesus says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Both Psalm 40 by David and Jesus' words recorded by Matthew remind us that we must remain patiently committed to God. We must completely rely on Him, on His word. It's like that praise song, right, Janet? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Speaking of praise songs, it takes us to verse 3 here of Psalm 40. So we see here David goes through this. I waited patiently for the Lord. I, he turned to me. He heard my cry. He's my help. He's my deliverer. He reached down. He rescued me from the slimy pit. And look at verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. I feel like what David is saying here is that when God works in our lives, when we trust him and we say, God, I believe that you're going to rescue me out of this miry bog and you actually put your commitment in the Lord's hands, say, God, I commit to you whatever I'm going through and people watch that. They also see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him because you are that witness well god did that in his life god did that in her life and i'm going to trust him now i'm going to have remember that fear speaks of in the bible of respect or reverence for god i'm going to i'm going to revere this god we're moving into the next section here Section two, again, all of this has to do with God is our help, our deliverer. But God is faithful. In verses four through ten, I feel like David just narrows in on how God is faithful. Tremble and do not sin. I am in the wrong psalm. That is totally Psalm 4, verse 4. Let me take you to Psalm 40, verse 4. All right, Psalm 40, verse, that's, I mean, that's good. But he says here, happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust. Don't you like that? That's the New Revised Standard Version. Love the way that's put. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust. Have you made the Lord your trust? Do you continue to help others in your life? Make the Lord their trust. Who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. Let's see how I did with, oh yeah, we're good now. We're back in, we're back in, you guys. All right, Psalm 40, verse 5 and 6. Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, they would be too many to declare. 
David said, there really is no way to share all of the wondrous things you have done. Verse 6, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. I love verse 6 because ultimately this is what God wants. God wants and desires us to take delight in him, to listen to him. And of course, as we do that, God is pleased and the more we do that, we kind of build this spiritual habit of listening and being more obedient to God. And notice here in verse 6, he says, my ears you have opened. You might have an older, let's see if it, I have to move my, my 40 TP. Let's see here. Psalm, let's see what the uh, Psalm 40 says in this NIV here. Because you might have something different. Psalm 40 says here, verse 6, You have given me an open ear. You might have it where it says you've pierced my ear. Literally, the Hebrew speaks of dug my ear. What is David saying? You have made it possible. You have got me You've got my attention. I am hearing and you've made it so that I can listen and listen well. I want to follow you. I think you get this feeling as we go through this section here that David is like, I am committed to this God who is my help and my deliverer. Verses 7 and 8, we got here. David says this. He says, then I said, here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire, verse 8, to do your will. I mean, you couldn't get more clear of a statement than that about David, right? God, I desire to do your will. My God, your law is what? Within my heart. What is one of the objectives to this Your Psalm series? Is that we're hiding God's word in our heart. We're making a point to memorize scripture. In fact, speaking of that, Here's the, here's the ones that I decided to make my memory verses, 9 and 10. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips, Lord, as you know. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. Many of you have heard my story of how I came to Michigan, and I came here, and I, I literally, I didn't really know anybody. I'd met John Gundon, and I met him for like two weeks, all right? I'm from Oregon. John invited me out here, and I come to Michigan. I remember one night laying in bed, looking up in the dark room in this, this house. It was just me living at the time. I just moved to Michigan young man, and I just remember thinking, this is 14 years ago, and I remember thinking, Lord, what, what am I doing? You know, I moved from Portland, Oregon to Pigeon, Michigan. I mean, it was, it was a little change. And I remember just laying in bed thinking, God, what's going on? And I, I share this with you because I remember a few times just getting on my knees, and I remember just saying, God, I want to be a warrior with my words. God, I feel you're calling me, and I want to be a warrior with my words. And so as I read through Psalm 40, that's why I said, I want to memorize those. I proclaim your saving acts in the great assembly. I think, of course, David has in mind the temple, right? Or when the, the, uh, the children of Israel, Israel would all gather together, and, and David says, I am not going to stay quiet, but in general, in my life, this is what I want to be. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and your saving help. I do not conceal your love and your faithfulness from the great assembly. I want to be that. God will speak to you and to me on things. And I think it's important as we go through his word, ask yourself, and you might be thinking, oh man, my psalm's super short. I don't know. Maybe there's a psalm that really appeals to you or speaks to you. Make that your psalm. 
But I really encourage you to pick a psalm and make a point to, to memorize some of the verses out of it, to read it at least twice a week, and to share with three people what you're doing. And I'll tell you right now, I'm thankful for that cry room back there. I'll tell you. All right. Where am I at? So we're going into the final section here. God is our help and our deliverer. Let's look at it together. Do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me. For troubles without numbers surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head and my heart fails within me. David now turns to asking God to save him again. Remember the... Hey, Jude. Jude, sit down. Remember in the beginning, Psalm 40 opened with... David praising God for rescuing him, pulling him out of that miry pit. And now David shifts his praise again and says, God, I'm in trouble. And notice here that he gives us this twofold problem. Part of the problem is it's outside of David's circumstances or his ability to control, right? It's out of his ability to control the situation. The other part is what? The trouble is my own sin. So David says, I need your help again, God. There are things going on that are outside of my control that I need you to rescue me from. But also, God, there is an issue in my own heart, the sin that I have chosen to do. In fact, he said, it's made it so I cannot see. Sin blinds us, keeps us from seeing things the way we ought to, the way God wants us to see things. Oftentimes, sin creates blind spots so we don't see how bad we are. Remember, Pastor Ken was here, and he took us to Matthew 7. Remember this classic? I'm not going to read it all to you, but you guys look up here. You know what this classic passage of Jesus's is. Hey, why are you so worried about your brother and the little splinter in his eye when you walk around this big old two-by-four ten in your eye? What's up with that? We oftentimes, because of sin, are blinded by what's going on in our own lives. I said this earlier. It's worth reiterating. A big part of what this sermon is about is God is our help and our deliverer. And this extends way beyond just guidance for a career, when I should retire, or maybe about this relationship I want to get in, or maybe about working through a family relationship issue. Now, wait a minute. Does God want to be a part of those things? 100%. Absolutely. God wants to speak into your life about a career or when you should retire or maybe a situation with a family member and how you can bring amends and then there can be forgiveness. God absolutely does. But we need to remember who we're talking about here. That isn't only what God is interested in. God is all-powerful. He became a human he became like us. Jesus took on the sins of the world. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. He made it so that we could understand God in a way we never could have if Jesus hadn't come. And he wants to rescue us from that sin. He wants us to have a new life right now and start living with him and change the way we live for now and in eternity. Whose tremendous love and grace changes all of us. We got to remember God is that big and he is that concerned. And as David said, there are a twofold there is a twofold issue here. We got issues going on in our lives that are outside of our control and we need God's help. But we also got an issue of sin that we all must deal with. You might you guys might be uh, pretty familiar with this. I like it. It's also a psalm. Psalm 139. Definitely not steal anyone's psalm here. Psalm 139 right here. Psalm 139. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Verse 24 in particular. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We need that because we need a God who saves us from our... You guys, it doesn't take very long to watch the news and think, man, this world is broken. 
What in the world is going on out there, as I heard one pastor say recently? What is going on out there? And we're reminded, oh yeah, I know what's going on. The brokenness of this world, the sin that we have to deal with in our own hearts, everyone else has to, and we see that sin being played out on people. And it's unfair at times, and it's broken, and it's really hard to see and to watch. We need a God who rescues. We need a God who is our help and our deliverer. And, and we need guidance. It reminds me of another psalm, Psalm 119. Your, lamp, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light of my path. God, we need your help and your guidance. Now, verses 13 through 17... This is what I've done. Let me see here. As we close, let me see if I missed anything. I'll bring it up here. But I've, I've kind of changed it a little bit. We mean you changed the Bible. I don't even know if you guys caught that. I'll tell you what I did. See, I, I think verses 13, 16, and then 17 is on the next slide. I think these verses are really good to change from first person to third person. And I think they serve as a really good prayer, in particular, for those brothers and sisters in Christ in other parts of the world that I mentioned earlier. You know, we, we don't know what's going on in Afghanistan. I know Nigeria faces, in, in certain parts of Nigeria, it's pretty serious to be a Christian. You know you're going to probably meet some pretty serious persecution. This, I thought, if we turn it from first person to third person, it serves as a nice prayer for them. So let me read this through. Verse 13, Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver our brothers and sisters in the Lord. O Lord, make haste to help them. Verse 14, let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away their lives. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in their hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to them, aha, aha. Verse 16, but may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. Verse 17, but as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. I encourage you to take verses 13 through 17 this week. Turn it from first to third person and pray for those Christian brothers and sisters in other parts of the world that you know are facing tremendous persecution. Make that our prayer for them. God is the help and the deliverance. How he chooses to help, how he chooses to move, that's, that's God's doing. But we are called to pray, are we not, church? All right, so application, the so what. Let's just make sure we all got it here. So no matter what we're going through, God hears our cries. Even though we might be walking through the valley of the shadow of death, God hears our cries and he's walking with us. And we need a God like that, don't we? Who's present and who's listening. And God is our rescuer. He's primarily the one who's rescued us from our own sin. And that is what's so significant about the cross. God is able to work, though, also in our lives in the little things. In the very important things in our lives that may not be on a grand scale to others, but they matter to us. God is going to work in our lives. He is faithful to save us. To save us from our sins. And God is the one who helps us. We need to turn things around. Or when we're faced with situations that are outside of our control. God is there to help us. He is faithful. And of course... As I've stressed throughout this psalm, he is our help and our deliverer. Praise God for that. Let's pray. Lord, we just, just lift up this, uh, this reminder that came out of your word, which is that you are our help and our deliverer. God, help us to 
keep that at the forefront of our minds as we go forward, as we pray for others, pray for those, God, uh, who are in desperate need of you and your grace and your protection, your provision. God, we pray, Lord, that you would remind each of us that you help us with things that are outside of our control and you help us with the things that we have caused on our own, their own sinful choices. Lord, you long to be that help and that deliverer and to restore that relationship with you. God, help us this week to be faithful. Help us, Lord, to make that psalm that corresponds with our age our psalm and encourage others to do the same. We love you, Lord, and we, we ask just, I pray, a special blessing, rather, on the church. Will you be with them, protect them, and bless them over this Labor Day weekend. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.